the first speaker is Molly, and the way to one's heart is through the stomach. All right. It's you. Thank you. As you can see from this charming pickup line, which is just one of the many that the internet has to offer to the inquiring Googler, the link between food and eroticism in the modern consciousness goes far beyond offering aphrodisiacal foods to, like oysters and chocolate to your date in hopes of getting them in the mood. While the effectiveness of comparing one's desired sexual partner to food as a romantic strategy might be up for debate, we can say with certainty that it dates back at least as far as the Theocritus' bucolic poetry of the Hellenistic period. The classicists among us will be most familiar with Theocritus' use of food as a temptation to romance in Idyll 11, where the gawky and unattractive Cyclops, Polyphemus, still an innocent teenager years before his encounter with Odysseus, which we saw on some pottery yesterday, um, attempts to woo the whiter than cream cheese Galatea by enticing her with the finest milk and an endless bounty of cheese. Elsewhere in the Theocritean corpus, lovers offer to their beloveds the ingestible produce of pastoral labor or the means to produce it, milk-bearing goats, sweet fruits, and various other tasty lures. In exchange, the lovers say that the objects of their affection offer certain food-like temptations of their own, a physique riper than a pear, or skin the color of honey. Before we dive in, though, um, I'd like to take a moment to situate Theocritus and his poetry for those who are less familiar. Theocritus was born in Sicily and lived during the 3rd century BCE. He spent some time working at the Alexandrian court in Egypt in the 270s. At this time, Alexandria was the main Greek city in Ptolemaic Egypt and would have been a bustling urban center filled with people from a wide variety of ethnic and cultural backgrounds from all over the Greek world. So, in the 270s, Theocritus was living in a cosmopolitan hub of the Hellenistic world, which, as we can see from this map of Alexander's conquests, extended tremendously far and encompassed land, belonging to numerous cultures with numerous cuisines and, of course, access to many exotic ingredients. Alexandria's status as a major Hellenistic hub and its convenient coastal location also made it a hotbed for trade, especially in spices. No doubt then that Theocritus and his contemporaries would have been familiar with the economic appeal of flavorful food. However, the world represented in Theocritus's poetry is not so cosmopolitan. His bucolic poems reflect a simpler, more rustic way of rural living that might have had a sort of quaint nostalgia for urban Alexandrians. Nevertheless, the enticing pleasures of fine food and the trade that was so vital to life in Alexandria are certainly present against Theocritus's pastoral background. Very well then. Uh, in this paper, I posit the existence of a pastoral erotic food-driven economy in Theocritus's idols, in which tempting foods not serve not so much as aphrodisiacs, but as elements of an exchange between the lover and the beloved. The admirer barters his supply of food and means of producing it, obvious symbols of pastoral success and the ability to provide sustenance, for the equally, if not more tempting, food-like charms of the admired. The pastoral erotic food economy is based on the trade of incommensurate gratifications. There is, to our knowledge, no standard value by which the Hellenistic Greek reader might have expected gustatory and dietary pleasures to be traded. Theocritus' economy reconciles this discrepancy by rendering the incommensurate, food and sex respectively, commensurate by describing physical beauty in terms of food rather than flesh. Before one can identify the elements of Theocritus' pastoral erotic economy, it's necessary to specify the parameters that define such a sort of economy. Obviously, typical economic models are not suitable for this type of economy in question. Uh, what the Theocritus displays is not a simple exchange of goods or services for some commensurate form of compensation, for example, my coffee for your tea, or more directly relevant, cash for sex. The Theocritus' wooers and wooed are not depicted as pornai, that is to say, common prostitutes in Greek, or their patrons, and a distinction must be drawn between the processes of courtship and prostitution. In some ways, the Theocritean economic relationship more closely resembles a gift-giving economy reminiscent of the Greek tradition of gift exchange as part of Xenia, or guest friendship, um, as part of the Xenia relationship, 
rather than a commodity exchange. It establishes relationships between human beings, probably of the ongoing variety rather than one-night trysts, and under normal circumstances, sex and love are difficult to measure, much less assign a trade value. However, describing the relationships between Hetaira and their clients in classical Athens as a form of Xenia, uh, Hetaira are more like courtesans uh, who have longer-term companionship relationships with their cli clients. Um, James Davidson argues that the difference between these two kinds of relationship becomes even more fraught when one of the items exchanged is sex. In classical Athens, it is never simply a question of whether you do it for money or do it for gifts. To turn sexual intercourse into an exchange of alienable commodities involves a great deal of a great effort of reification. Davidson's argument stands in the Hellenistic period as well, but the relationships in the idols behave somewhat differently from the hetaira client relationship that Davidson describes. For one, reification becomes less of an issue when the object of desire, the flesh of the beloved, is commodified by its equation to various types of food. An exchange of love for cheese is complicated by the fact that these two items are incommensurate. Cheese has a distinct trade value, variable as that may be from day to day, but romantic love then as now is hardly quantifiable. To render these items commensurate, one or the other must change. And in the Theocratean erotic economy, one of them does. When Galatea's skin is likened to cream cheese, a commodity exchange between Polyphemus's turos, a word used for cheese generally, and Galatea's pacta, essentially cream cheese, seems far more reasonable. And um, we'll get a little bit further into that later on. In addition, the lover barter is not just a one-off meal, but a long-term reward. To offer one's beloved a prized animal or a lifetime supply of prime Sicilian cheese is to display one's great success in the the Theocratean bucolic world, where one's entire livelihood depends on pastoral produce. To do this is to demonstrate one's ability to provide sustenance and security for the beloved as a reward for the beloved providing access to the food-like pleasures of his or her body. The exchange in question is not a one-off sexual transaction, but the basis of a potentially lifelong relationship and possibly the formation of an oikos or household. Uh, oikos, it is worth noting, is the etymological or an etymological predecessor to our English word economy. Coincidence? Uh, they only get worse. As it goes. Um, the first allusions in the idols to a pastoral erotic food exchange occur in idol three. Here we see food only on one side of the exchange. The offer of the lover, um, the offer of the lover. After the beloved Amaryllis fails to respond to the smitten goatherd's gift of ten apples in line ten. Her admirer, frustrated with her indifference, mentions a goat that he's keeping for her, which happens to have had twins recently and thus supposedly would produce an especially ample supply of milk. Uh, we have that here. Perhaps the goatherd seems to consider if a standard love token, apples will not work as they did for Hippomenes when he wished to marry Atalanta, which the goatherd references just slightly afterward in lines 40 to 42, the promise of a healthy, high-producing goat the height of success for one whose living depends on herding goats for milk production might be enough to win her over. Failing that, the goat herd makes an appeal to envy by way of increased competition in the market. If you won't make the trade I want, surely Merman's serving girl will. Uh, the milk laden goat strategy does not seem to work as a token of exchange for the goat herd in Idol 3, but its effectiveness is proven in the case of Comitas, whose lover, Clearista, sees him milking his twin-bearing goats in Idol 5 and offers to join him out of admiration for his rustic prosperity. Just a few lines later, we see the very same Clarista displaying her love for Comitas by pelting him with apples. Whether or not a Caprine mother of two is a reliable item to trade for the affections of a woman is a question that may never be answered satisfactorily. Nevertheless, the offer of a high-producing goat exemplifies pastoral achievement and serves as a clear symbol from lover to beloved that the former will be capable of providing food and success in their hopefully shared future. Elsewhere, we see parts of the loved, beloveds compared to various sweet foods, namely honey and fruit. These comparisons are unsurprising in light of the commonness of apples as a token given exchange, in exchange for the beloved's favor. Of these sweet foods, honey is the least common comparandum for flesh in the idols, but it's still worth note when it appears in Idol 10, lines 26 and 27. 
where the besotted Bukeus says to his love interest, beautiful Bambuka, they call you Syrian, skinny, sunburnt, but I alone call you honey-colored. Most interesting about this passage is that it shows where the act of commodification occurs, that is, in the mind of the lover. There's no mistaking in this contest that Bambuka is in no way truly like honey in value, even if she is literally the color of honey, her darker complexion would not measure up to that of the traditionally beautiful milky white Galatea. Bambuka is not, to anyone other than the smitten Bukeus, valuable within the pastoral erotic food economy. Her worth in this economy, unlike literal honey, which can be quite priced quite easily, is completely subjective and dependent on Bukeus' attraction to her. Bukeus' love creates a demand for what Bambuka supplies. In Idol 7, sweetness is also in great supply. In a space of but six lines, 115 through 120, we see fruit comparisons applied both to the beloved Philanus and the very concept of love itself in the form of erotes, um, just being the pearl of eros poetic here. Um, Hopkinson would have us believe that the phrase apioio pepiteros, riper than a pear, should be viewed negatively. That is to say, um, that to be riper than a pear implies that the beloved Philanus is maturing quickly and is scarcely worth pursuing any longer. Uh, this is possible, but a survey of LSJ, Big Greek Dictionary, uh, suggests that this is not necessarily the case, offering only positive examples, accepting the literal ripe as used for a melon or gourd, or Opeponesi weaklings in Iliad Book 2, which is clearly not applicable in this scenario. More appropriate would be the Homeric metaphorical gentle or good. The slipping away of Philanus's Kalon Anthos, a beautiful flower, i.e. his youth, in the following lines need not diminish the appeal of the ripe fruit while his youthful flower is still in bloom. After all, ripeness indicates a readiness for plucking and need not mean that the person or fruit in question is overripe. The tree fruit metaphors continue as Polyphemus calls Galatea his sweet apple in Idol 11, line 39, um, and Daphnis, in what may or may not constitute a rape scene, grabs the breast of his beloved and likens it to an apple. Um, here he says, I will teach these first lessons to your velvety apple. Um, on this line, Barbara Hughes Fowler says, the quality of her flesh is deliciously suggested by describing her breasts as velvety noanta apples. Um, the verb is elsewhere used of the down when it first appears on a young man's cheeks and on the bloom of fruit. The representation of female flesh is a major achievement of the Hellenistic sculptures. In this poem, the same is accomplished here uh, by the velvety apples and earlier, uh, obliquely by the mention of grapes, roses, milk, and honey, all that is sweet and luscious. Uh, according to Fowler, not only is the metaphor here quite vivid, but it also parallels prevailing artistic styles of its time perhaps an indication that this particular metaphor and those in the same vein might have particularly resonated with Theocritus's Hellenistic audience. Surely, if nothing else, the Hellenistic reader could not have missed the erotic significance of the apple itself. In the same poem, Daphnis also refers to his apple-breasted lover as a grape, although not in a very flattering light. Uh, the grape, he says, will become a raisin. Compare this to Polyphemus' description of Galatea as shinier than an unripe grape in Idol 11. The erotic appeal of a woman who shines brighter than an unripe grape may be lost on the modern reader, but clearly the phrase meant something quite seductive to Polyphemus, despite his ignorance of winemaking, which of course we also covered yesterday. In line 46, he uses the term meles kissos, sweet vine, to indicate that he wishes to offer grapes to Galatea, demonstrating both that he's probably familiar enough with grapes to use them effectively in metaphors, and that he sees literal grapes as a fitting trade for Galatea's grape-like good looks. The idea of trading literal sweetness for figurative sweetness therefore runs throughout the idols. The Theophilus' romantic exchanges go far beyond actual apples or roses or ringlets to encompass the concept of human charms as sweet, delicious foods. In these exchanges, we primarily see the beloved side of the trade as opposed to the lovers, which we saw in the case of Bucaeus and Comatas's goats. Considering these two halves of the exchange together, we're now in an ideal position to reflect further on Polyphemus and Galatea's exchange, one that covers the offerings of both the lover and the beloved. 
um, this is perhaps one of the greatest gems of Greek poetry, so just take that in. Uh, let us now consider the most famous proposed exchange between Polyphemus and his beloved nymph, the offer of endless cheese in return for allowing him sexual access to her whiter than cream cheese body. Um, and he says, O oh, white Galatea, why do you flee from the one who loves you? Whiter than cream cheese to behold, gentler than a lamb, more skittish than a calf, and shinier than an unripe grape. Try that one at the pub. <laughs> As stated above, when Galatea's skin is likened to cream cheese, a commodity exchange between Polyphemus's Toros and her Pacta suddenly seems far more reasonable in the world of the pastoral than an exchange of cheese for sex. Redefining the exchange as a trade of one type of cheese for another imparts a value on each offering that, due to the similarity of the items on the proverbial table, is clearly commensurate. It analogizes the interaction to a transaction that could plausibly happen between two cheesemakers in a pastoral community on any given day. It is worthwhile then, uh, now that we've considered what Polyphemus wishes to gain from Galatea, to examine that which he proposes as a trade. On the subject of Polyphemus's offer in Idol 11, G.O. Hutchinson says, more important in the song is the Cyclops' unelevated emphasis on his dairy product, not incidentally, but as a prime weapon in his campaign of seduction. Against his undesirable appearance, he sets first the abundance of his flocks, which sounds well enough, and then the excellence of his milk and his unfailing supply of cheese. Perhaps most interesting here, aside from Hutchinson's entertaining description of dairy as a prime weapon in his campaign of seduction, is his understanding that Polyphemus's offer of dairy in return for Galatea's love is, as he says, unelevated. Generally, an unelevated attempt to woo one's lover would be unexpected in a love song. Invocation of the muses or grand verbal gestures of pining admiration seem more fitting to us, and perhaps more persuasive, but elevated gestures would seem out of place in Theocritus's pastoral landscape. Catherine Gutzwiller reads Polyphemus's lines in um, 34 and following and 72 through 75 as a confusion of hurting and loving, an inability to separate the attractions of his girl from those of his ewes, and a necessary consequence of his inherent animality. To accept such a reading, however, is to isolate this poem from the rest of the idols, to ignore the fact that it's not just Polyphemus, the animalistic monster, who equates love to the produce of pastoral work. The several partial and whole exchanges I've detailed in this paper are just a few of many references to the yields of pastoral labor uh, that they have value in the economy, but also in the pastoral erotic food economy that exists in the world of bucolic poetry. Uh, as demonstrated in my first slide, exchanges of this sort are not limited to the ancient world. And so, looking forward and outward, I'd like to suggest that further application of this model to exchanges of erotic and gustatory pleasures in both the past and the present may well pr prove fruitful in a wider breadth of disciplines. Thank you. Okay, we have um, five minutes or so for all questions. Um, Be gentle. Yes, you have the lady first. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it, it certainly struck me that, that you're talking pastoral economies, but um, the thing about most pastoral economies is that they keep the, the very basics, like the uh, ricotta cheese and so on in Italy, for themselves, while the more expensive, the harder cheeses, the butter and so on, is then sold off to market. So how much of this, I, I remember being told by somebody who um, was a goat herd and then a, a, a child or a shepherd and as a child actually stole a whole cheese and ate it mm -hmm. um, uh, and it was the most glorious thing in his life because he'd never had anything more than just the ricotta and it was worth the beating for sure. having that cheese. So how much of this do you think could be related to the fact that they were always hungry and that's why they focus on food? That's a, a big question, and perhaps one for several more papers. Um, Go for it. I, I think what I have to say here is that this is obviously very much a stylized fictional economy. And 
we are talking about a poet who was working at the Alexandrian court. So I'm not, I would hesitate to put an intention on Theocritus, but I don't know if I would think of him as writing about people being literally very hungry. And he's not talking about staple foods like barley or what have you. Well, st those staple foods are still, for the citizens, you wouldn't have had them in the pastoralist area, oh. would you, really? You know, if, if you had read, it would have been the coarsest of the coarse, with all of the, the stuff that ends mm -hmm. up in teeth, you know, debris, whatever. Um, but how much, again, then, it, you know, did he actually create this himself, do you think, or would he perhaps have stolen it from the peasants when he was out there and overheard them singing their love songs and what have you? Um. In the same way as, what's his name, that British composer went out and nicked all of the... Uh, oh, that's the one, yeah. <laughs> um. He made the money and the folk songs disappeared, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... We don't have a whole lot of evidence of what your everyday farmer was <coughs> singing to um, to the object of his affection, so it's hard to say, because uh, we certainly don't have Theocritus telling us that he was going out no, well, he stealing ideas from people. Could I just uh, mark the first to the yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, that struck me, listening to the different comparisons, how similar this is in some ways to um, the Song of Songs, the Biblical Song of Songs. You've got the same sort of woman's body as food, you've got the same eroticism, you've got the apples, you've got the dark woman who says, I'm, I'm black but comely, O oh, you daughters of Jerusalem. You've got the same jumping over the hills in your skittish calf. I mean, is there any sort of relationship between a mu a, this biblical book and these Hellenistic poems? Or is it just that this is the genre and everybody uses the same sort of comparisons? Um, I think there is just generally a very easy comparison to be made between a woman's body and food because there is a nurturing aspect of a woman's body um, and that for babies food comes out of a woman's body and before the baby is born um, it is nourished within so yes would, would they actually have been in contact with each other would there have been actual flows of encounters and you know made particularly in terms of you know, poetry and song and, you know, the actual cultural encounters in which this would take place? Oh, surely, yes. Yeah. Well, this and is silk in road. the Silk Road went as far In as Alexandria, as well. certainly, yeah. yeah. Well, of course, in Alexandria, that yeah. this will be Alexandria. Is not this, is, this is perhaps just before um, the Septuagint, the Septuagint was the, the translation uh, into Greek of, of the Hebrew scriptures was made, but, but very, very shortly before. Do you think uh, it's the same century that that, that, um, that the Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek? And Alexandria. And so maybe they were. They would be there new. were earlier translations in the Septuagint oh, yes. itself. Possibly. Exactly. Yes. I mean, maybe there's some way of being connected. So I mean, there would have been translate. There would have been translations or readings going on earlier on before they actually formally got translated. Yes, although it, it, it would be a question whether the court and the, uh, and the, and the library and the circles that the orators moved in were aware of Jewish scriptures or not, just at this time. But fairly soon afterwards, they could have been. Maybe then yeah. they could have been at this time. Yeah. I mean, the, the Song of Songs nowadays, I don't know what happens in Hellenistic times, is a public synagogue reading on uh, festival of Passover. Um, so perhaps, you know, it was being read in Greek already publicly and, and yeah. the idea of being, you know, already being publicly read before being actually transmitted to text. Mm -hmm. Sorry, but, 
I, uh, I was reading, I love your combinations, the Greek there, the interesting comment, the, the thing, maybe because I can read Greek that I really enjoy the, the juxtaposition. But as I, I was reading the things about grapes, I, I couldn't help but remember a very famous movie quip where Mae West sees Cary Grant and she's practically in a sweat and she says to her maid, Beulah, peel me a grape. And I always, you know, she was such an educated lady. I, I, I'm just wondering if maybe she was making an illusion to we just see the That's the problem. Yeah, yeah. So she was so far. She was so far. Everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but I um, wanted to give you that example yeah. because that is a very, everybody, well, at least my generation, everybody knows that quotation. Mine too. Well, yeah, there you go. There's your proof that this can be used later on. It's, 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 it's carried on for a very long time. Yes. yes. Yeah. It's very interesting to see the way the apple appears because today, you know, in Sainsbury, the apple is the most boring of fruits. But it reminds me of Amber's paper and, and the many apples there once were and still are. So this is interesting. But what, what I'm looking at or wondering about is the things that aren't said here but must be bubbling up, um, you know, of below, which is um, love magic love potions, sex magic, um, which, which doesn't appear in, the, in this rather lofty and artistic poetry, but must be driving this all. I mean, is there any of that? Um, not in these particular poems, but um, I think it's, it's it'll too, uh, that involves quite a good deal of spooky love magic. Great, because, I mean, you know, anthropologists in the field would love to um, collect this information and often do, but we, uh, not having the language, get ourselves locked out of the ancient world and we wonder what's out there, because it must be. So when you've done the next few papers that you're working on, perhaps um, you could do that, love magic, um, <laughs> through food and drink. Yeah, <laughs> um, there's certainly been plenty of work on love magic, not so much through food and drink, but um, yeah, it, it's there, it's interesting. And it's, it's in the Hittite texts as well, the, the Hittite and the Assyrian texts, uh, there's a lot of them that have got love magic and that sort of thing. Connected to food, and, uh, ingestion, and things. Yes. I, I can't remember of how it's long time since I did it, but I do remember mm -hmm. it's a lot of it. So it would be then the connection between love magic and poison. Yes. The pharmacopoeia. Yes. So close. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. You know, what do you. What do you <laughs> hey, love and hate. Hatred poison and, and, you know, revenge. Yes. You know. All the way up to Snow White, yes. Mm. Yes. Mm. yes. Yeah, I have a question. This is all for me. Um, okay. So, uh, <laughs> do you see, because uh, part of my dissertation was how uh, um, Latin authors often compare women to honey and cinnamon. That's a, kind of a common one that they use. And you, I saw you have honey here. Do you have cinnamon and honey as well? Uh, I didn't notice anything with cinnamon at all in the operatives. Yeah. I, this is pretty much everything food related that I found <laughs> in the whole of the Aquitaine corpus. Okay. Okay. Cinnamon would have been too rare and expensive for Sicilian fantasy shepherds even to know. About. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so what happened with your, your, your quote then? What, well, no, I just, I just noticed, so I just kind of brought, wrote about this idea that they, um, they, they start to align sex in food, but the woman becomes consumable uh, in this kind of honey. She's always, her breath or her skin tastes like honey. Photos tastes like uh, uh, honey. And cinnamon, their breath smells like cinnamon. Um, uh, I think Marshall has some love poetry where she, women are compared to cinnamon again. So I was just, but that's interesting. So it's coming later. The cinnamon's causing it. Yeah. Okay. Well, you have cinnamon in Mesopotamia. I do. Um, quite early on, there's it's some um, words that are, should definitely be translated as cinnamon. That's I really think going back to the the millennium, sort of that many Maybe well they're certainly getting stuff from the Indus, from Afghanistan, all over the place. They definitely had a whole variety of different spices. Yeah. And that's what's interesting I, I mentioned yesterday about this site I visited where they 
they had a whole load of spices in the residue. Mm -hmm. They have all had a, a whole variety of also funky herbs that they found in mm. Edna, where they refer to it as a medicine cabinet. Um, so certainly, and in Mesopotamia, women are always described sexually as food, and mm. uh, Ishtar is often described in a sort of food way, like, like food. Um, that's another comparison. Yeah, there we go. No, okay. always, yeah. Yeah. That sounds more like we start as food, with food in terms of nurturing food. No, it's actually very it's sexual because she's the goddess of sexual love. Wow. Um, and so it's always very strongly connected. And a whole variety, going back to the third millennium, you have um, women described sexually uh, in terms of food. Um, so you yeah, consume them. There's also, I, I want to mention that uh, like if you haven't read the article, I have to send it to you. If there's a special edition of Journal of Food and Food Waste on masculinity, there's a most fantastic article on how women are portrayed as like things you consume in men's health magazine. It's fantastic. I mean, about how, how uh, creating a sense of masculinity through <coughs> the consumption of women in a variety of different ways and uh, how that creates and you have to create and maintain uh, your masculinity through uh, talking about it in specific ways and things. That's it. It's yeah, I recommend everyone to go find a special issue of Food and Food Ways on masculinity and read this article on men's health. Yeah, that so sounds like exactly <laughs> what I want to read on the airplane. Right, slow down. All right. Yes. Jane. Um, yeah. Hmm. All right. Yes, John. I would just maybe from, as a cultural anthropologist, I would just caution you against trying to extend the metaphors in a poem written by somebody in Alexandria about a fictional cyclop, cyclops trying to seduce a nymph with cheese and try to extend that to really say anything about what's going on in society in general. I mean, that's certainly, there are, these are metaphors which are coming out of a particular um, cultural context, but it, it feels like you're trying to you kind of put this within quote unquote pastoral economy and tie it to kind of deeper social processes, which are. Um, that's, that you probably can't really get out of a text like that. That's certainly not the intention. This is this is intended to be purely a philological exercise. Um, and, and maybe some of those ideas would have been floating around, but. This is specifically a fictional economy. Well, I was just thinking because you were talking about these other kinds of relationships and talking about the value of livestock and cheese and so forth and these economies, which certainly they had, certainly these other things, it certainly the, the types of relationships that you talked about existed and certainly these products had value, but whether one can then kind of make the connection those kind of real life things that existed in society at, at that time and the metaphors in a fictional thing, which you're, again, right. I understand how you're analyzing. Yeah, I, I think that I, I wouldn't say that anything from within this would look outward, but surely anyone familiar with an actual pastoral economy would take that knowledge and understand it when they're reading this. So well, I just, from having spent a lot of time in pastoral economies and knowing how they seduce people within them, um, not that I, no, she like, I like, her all my things like that she's a beautiful heifer and that her neck is like an ostrich, you know, and stuff like that, and which, so, which but doesn't have, have anything like, to do with the But the viewer, you know, it was EP on the viewer, it was all about the viewer and the beautiful spots and the colors and yeah, the crowd right. and everything. And they were quite literally so. I mean, they, they really did believe that these were, you know, just beautifully aesthetic objects. And, right. know, there's a whole aesthetic sort of, you know, in your, in your world, it is a whole aesthetic sort of the, of the animal in that sense. Yes. And, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. I would argue that cheese is the most beautiful thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got the cyclops to set you up with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll all get along with that. Okay, many thanks. Thank uh, you. Thank, thank you very much. You.